All right, here we go. Good afternoon. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Uh, board members, we have six members present, and I believe it is Ms. Thompson's first time in the boardroom. Ms. Thompson, welcome to the boardroom, although not welcome to the board. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Hairston is on the phone, so therefore we have a quorum. Um, we have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays? Aye. Nays, there being none, the motion is approved. We also have had an opportunity to review the minutes uh, outlined. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes as presented? So moved. Second. And these are the minutes for the September 21st, 2021 regular board meeting. Um, Ms. Johnson moved. Mr. Figures seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 There being no nays, the motion is approved. And with that, we are on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Green? Good evening, uh, board members, to our JPS administrators, our staff members, all of our scholars and parents and community members, all those joining us this evening, welcome. Uh, we'll begin as we typically do with the highlights reel from our instructional television team. Have you read any good books lately? Well, Jackson Public Schools top summer readers certainly have. JPS scholars Denyla Parker, Elena Hatcher, Denisha Trimble, and Asia Ramsey read a combined total of more than 300 books last summer. The voracious readers are part of the district's summer reading program that encourages scholars to read at least three books during the summer break. Denyla Parker, a third grader at Obama Magnet, read 200 books. Elena Hatcher, a second grader at Casey Elementary, read 62 books. Denisha Trimble, an eighth grader at Cordoza Middle School, read 26 books. And Asia Ramsey, a 10th grade scholar at Jim Hill, read 31 books. The top readers received a trophy, medal, and a Samsung Galaxy tablet. Read more about these remarkable summer readers at the district's website and also see the list of schools with the most readers. If you have a pre-K, kindergartner, or elementary school scholar, you definitely know about sight words and their importance to early learners. Fry sight words are the most commonly used words and should be recognized instantly by young readers. Elementary school parents are invited to join a fun-filled session to learn about the Fry Word Kit. Register at the JPS website and click on Raising Readers Parent Workshop to receive a virtual invitation to this event. The workshop is sponsored by JPS Parent and Family Engagement. For more information or to request a Spanish translator, please call the Parent and Family Engagement Center at 601 960-8945. Jackson Public Schools will celebrate College Spirit Day on Friday, October 8th. The theme is, I'm going to college. Exciting activities designed to create a mindset of going to college are planned. The celebrations will include pep rallies, parades, tailgates, career fairs, and much, much more. The College Spirit Day activities are sponsored by JPS in partnership with Ask for More Jackson. McWillie Assistant Principal Precious Malambeka was named to the inaugural cohort of the Ashe Leaders Fellowship. The JPS Administrator is one of 12 trailblazers selected from three communities nationwide. The expression Ashe is a West African concept about the power to make things happen and produce change. Following that perspective, Ashe is designed to identify leaders greatly develop their capacity and amplify their experiences as they bring positive change to their communities and beyond. Mellon Becca is currently in her third year as assistant principal at McWillie Elementary. Celebrations commemorating National Hispanic Heritage Month continue. Jackson Public Schools is honoring the occasion with special activities each week. Festivities continue until October 15th. Please visit our website to learn more about these exciting weekly celebrations. Fall break begins October 11th. All schools and offices will be closed. The district's official mobile app is now available. 
Get access to news, the district's directory, and much more. Download it on Google Play and the Apple App Store. Search for Jackson Public Schools MS. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools and on Twitter at JPS District. You can also watch all JPS programming on our YouTube channel at JPS ITV and on Comcast channels 18 and 19. As always, we want to thank our instructional television team um, for producing those videos and keeping us updated as to what's going on in our district. Uh, board members, the Mississippi Department of Education released the statewide results. Uh, released the statewide results from the uh, 21, 20, uh, 2021 Mississippi Academic Assessment Program, the MAP. Uh, test on September 23rd, um, and um, and the, those um, that data provides uh, firsthand evidence of the impact of um, the learning and the challenges, and of course the pandemic, um, all of that with our scholars and their achievement. At this time, I'm pleased to um, bring on our director of planning and evaluation, Latoya Blackshear, who will join us to provide an overview of our uh, map data and to outline some of our next steps uh, based on that data. This is Blackshear. So good evening, board president, Dr. Seaback, board members, Dr. Green. Tonight, I will share with you the 2021 Mississippi Account Academic Assessment Program results, better known as our MAP assessment uh, test data. As with all of our presentations, we like to remind you of our vision, mission, and core values, and that's what you see projected before you. The purpose of this presentation is to discuss where we are in terms of proficiency and outline our next steps based on data. Just to give you a little reminder, the MAP assessment was administered online. Um, it measures our students' knowledge, their skills, starting in elementary through high school. And again, we use it as a guide. We use it as, inf we use information to guide instruction. Now I wanna at this time take you a little bit, take a trip down memory lane. Round about March the 20th of 2020 school year, as we know, uh, traditional in-person learning was suspended. We did not test that year. Um, in the fall, we went virtual, we had packets, we had water crisis, you name it, we had it, okay? Also, during that same year, those students enrolled in grades three were required to take the state assessment but not meet the uh, required passing score, the same as our Algebra one, English two, Biology, and U.S. History. Our overall findings, our key findings of our 2021 MAP assessment our participation rate was 91.7, and as you know, the state requires a 91, a 95 uh, participation rate. However, it was re, um, waived that year. Our overall proficiency for math and ELA in 2021 decreased, and from 2019 in all grade levels, all subjects except for grade eight, ELA. We saw an increase of 2.5%, right in line with the state, they only saw uh, one tenth percent increase, but we showed 2.5, little celebration. Pre-COVID, we were decreasing the numbers of students in levels one to three, and increasing the numbers of students in levels four and five. So we were progressing well, all except for science, because that next year, that test did change, okay? Now, our district-wide focus, and you can see additional breakdown in your executive summary. Our district-wide focus of 2021 school year is basically accelerating all of our students to proficiency with a heavy focus on mathematics and writing. This slide here kind of sums up everything I said, uh, stated before. We were increasing proficiency in levels four and five in all of our subjects except for science, and we also wanted to show how we compare it to the state. The next couple of slides, you'll actually see where we wanted to take a closer look into our subgroups, ELA, math, and science. 
And we noticed that our non-African American students were outperforming or more proficient levels four and five than our African American. Then you see your females, males, our APAC versus our IB. We also looked at those gifted students. And we also recognize that we need to definitely accelerate our learning for our EL and our SPED students. And that's just the next couple of slides, and you can progress the next couple. And that's math, that's your science, your history. And of course, um, so what we also want to do is take a, a closer look into each one of our subject areas. So the next couple of slides you'll also see for math, ELA, uh, science, and history, we outline our overall proficiency rate. We also outline those standards that were problematic for us. If you look in the math slide, you'll see third grade, pretty much that whole assessment covered multiplication and division. And as student progressed to grade four, five, we noticed that one of those standards we have to make sure that we focus a little bit more is making sure that our students uh, understand and know how to simply multiply. This slide here um, that Sharon was on, it was our ELA. We also identified those problematic standards as well, and basically our students um, struggle with analyzing text. So we had to identify those standards so we know what professional development we need to build district-wide, but not only district-wide, we're gonna dig deep to make sure that we're providing each school with individualized professional development. And again, this is what you see for the next couple of slides as well, ELA, math, and science, U.S. history, is you're seeing the purpose. We're decreasing the number of students in levels uh, one to three. And again, we are um, increasing those students in levels four and five, pre-COVID. And then after COVID, and then how we compare it to the state. So I know that's a lot of information, so I'll pause right here just in case we have some questions. Well, before we take questions, just okay. uh, just another note on this. So uh, board members, <clears throat> excuse me, board members, we wanted to um, pretty quickly put the, the numbers in front of you uh, in terms of um, our proficiency rates. You, you heard from Mrs. Blackshear that um, you know, across the board, our participation rates were down from even what the uh, mm -hmm. what the state requirement typically is. Though that was waived, it's down. Well, that's important because um, school by school, um, you know, that the, the average across the district is 91 percent, but the average um, um, school by school varies. And so, as we're looking at the performance rates at each school, we we obviously need to kind of take into account how many of the scholars were there to assess, and even grade by grade, how many of them were there to assess. Uh, for us, and uh, another point that Mrs. Blackshear made earlier, we use uh, this kind of data to inform instruction. Well, because this is data um, from last school year, um, and you know, sometimes we will say this is a bit of an autopsy. You're seeing what happened last year. It does inform, help to inform, um, based on some of the trends that we see, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the trends across the board and trends within content areas and by skill, grade level and skill, it does provide us some sense of the kinds of uh, skills where we might need to go uh, more deeply, teach differently, support through professional development, um, build and focus our, inter, um, our uh, uh, interventions around uh, over the summer and into the next school year. So while we're not still using this data to say exactly where scholars are at this point, what, six months later, six or so months later, um, it's absolutely uh, informed how we were uh, thinking about uh, some of the needs and, um, and concerns um, uh, across the, the board here in the district. We have, uh, I believe you, we received or we, get, we provided a briefing of curricular programs and professional development, I don't know if that was the last meeting or a couple of meetings ago. Um, and of course, we are overlaying this data with, with those plans just to make sure that um, as we've seen a need for a heavier focus 
uh, not just with our scholars, but with our uh, educators in particular areas that we do that and, and focus our, our resources, our time, and our supports from outside and internal uh, supports for professional development around that. I think those are the um, kind of the final uh, points that I want to make on this. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one, one last piece, just kind of where we're going with assessment. Um, the state has not determined um, what will happen in the spring. We don't anticipate, the state doesn't, our state leaders, in fact, I was on a call earlier today on the State Superintendent's Advisory Committee um, of Superintendents. Um, the, the superintendent, the state superintendent, Dr. Wright, is not anticipating that we'll have waivers for the state exam for this year. So we do anticipate that we will have to take the exam, that we will be required to meet the level of participation. Um, and, and there's still some conversation as to how to treat the accountability uh, model. Uh, we do know that as of right now, although these test scores have been released, um, accountability grades will not be assigned to, to districts. New accountability grades will not be assigned to districts based on these assessment, um, this assessment data from the spring. Right? So this is more about, you know, we wanted to, to engage our scholars in assessment, get some sense of where they were um, back in the spring, and we already knew that we had to really redouble our efforts to um, accelerate their learning going forward. I'm gonna pause here and see what questions or commentary you might have. <clears throat> Happy to engage um, more with you around this. Uh, I don't think any of us are surprised to see the losses, right? Um, simply because of the context of the pandemic. I do wonder if you could help situate us more within similar districts within the state and how we're faring in relation to the state overall and in relation to comparable districts. I know there's not a lot comparable to JPS, but um, you know some of our sister school districts. And Because I think we're all expecting every district in the state pretty much to face significant losses because of the time lost. And um, she, she was moving a little quickly uh, at the beginning, but uh, one of the points that, doc, uh, uh, to your point, Dr. Luckett, um, one of the, the comments that Mrs. Uh, Blackshear made earlier around the state's overall decreases in both reading and mathematics. I think there was a one call out, was it mathematics at eighth grade? It was eighth grade ELA. ELA. So overall the state decreased in mathematics and ELA and we showed a, a decline as well, except for eighth grade ELA. Our proficiency increased by 2.5%. And so um, I don't know if we've done this calculation, but we should look at the rate of decline for the state and compare that to our rate of decline. Um, and this is all as compared to 2019, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's correct. The rate of decline. So we can look at that. Um, I know our team is also just crunching numbers uh, uh, based on what's been released just to see uh, r r rankings of school districts across the state. It's, you know, it's, it's, a curiosity, it doesn't really inform what you do next to support our, our scholars, but, um, but certainly we've seen um, those kinds of dips. And we will look to, again, to your point, at some of the districts that we tend to compare ourselves to, whether it's uh, by size or context. And there really isn't another district with both our size and context, but looking at both those. Also in your executive summary, you will see the rate of change. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or wonderings or, um, I mean, we're happy to also go back and, and crunch some, uh, look at some different analyses after you all have, you know, pondered more. I'm sort of curious about what's going on in the classroom in terms of remediation and then also trying to move forward to prepare them for testing in March? It's a great question. Um, I will begin to respond, and I know I've got a whole lot of smart people here who are much more closely attached to what's happening in schools who uh, will um, not let me falter. Uh, so our big three uh, focus this year, the A, A B, C, 
um, instructional focus. Acceleration is the A. B, balanced assessment, and C, a culture of uh, feedback. And so in, in acceleration, um, there are a few kind of uh, sub uh, parts um, and focus areas. One is around just uh, really front loading and building and developing a stronger um, vocabulary as well, um, focusing on writing. Writing shows up in so many ways and it's just another way, well, in and of itself, it's a, it's a skill and a strength that we want our scholars to build out, but it also helps, to, um, helps our scholars to process what they're learning. Uh, and to turn it around and cement their learning if they're able to write about it, uh, concepts or, or what have you, even mathematics and explaining their, their computations and that. Um, in the acceleration, uh, we typically will focus on the grade level standards and skills. So if I'm in third grade, what are third graders expected to know and be able to do in our standards, on the assessments, from the curriculum, all of those together. And then uh, in looking at uh, and, and moving through that grade level instruction, identifying some of the precursor skills that a third grader, in this case last year in, in second grade, might either have missed or, or simply they didn't stick. Those skills didn't stick. And so as teachers are teaching grade level content, constantly kind of pulling in that reteach or um, uh, intervention of the, the, um, the uh, necessary skills to ensure that that new skill is, is cemented um, and mastered. As you might imagine, teaching grade level content in and of itself is huge and difficult and a challenge and, and all those things. Uh, doing that with a constant uh, uh, view towards the potential skills that scholars may have missed last year, um, you know, that's really challenging. The dirty little secret, though, is that that's teaching. That, that happens anyway. It's, it's on steroids now because we've had this year, year plus of interrupted and, and whatever else we want to say about instruction and learning um, and life. Uh, during the pandemic, but, but teachers do that kind of work anyway. There's just a huge, huge focus on doing it and doing it well um, and expertly given what we know about uh, our scholars' lives and, and our lives over the past year plus. Um, the other thing that I'll call out, and, and I know our team has been, and, and I've been um, engaged in a bit of discussion around this, is uh, to the extent that first teaching, that first time that we teach a new skill, a new concept, to the extent that we can teach it expertly, precisely, and ensuring that more and more of our scholars show mastery, that's yet another way to accelerate learning. You might recall from some years past, we've, we've talked a lot about interventions and our efforts to kind of narrow the number and the amount of interventions that we use and focus much, much more on what we call first teaching, the initial instruction that the teacher does and all of the activities and practice and homework and, and checks for understanding, all those things that teachers do. But ensuring that there's a need for less intervention after they've done that first amazing instruction. And so our supports to teachers is, is trying to ramp up and ensure that that first, that first crack at it is, is as Im impactful as possible. It's kind of some of the sausage making and teaching and learning, but that's where the, where the real magic happens. Anything you'll, else you want to add to um, uh, acceleration versus remediation or any of that? Thank you summed it up well. <laughs> I feel like I might get my hand slapped later, y'all. <laughs> well, that was helpful. Um, my second question would be to then how are, I know that my children have gotten notices for after school programs and those kinds of things, and how central are those to this remediation process? I'm actually going to see if either Dr. Cormack or another member of the team want to um, speak to some of the after school programming and how we're attempting to weave that, that programming and support student 
uh, acceleration of student learning. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so uh, addressing our after school, our out of school time experiences uh, with this board support, uh, we have funded an executive director of innovative strategy. Uh, Dr. Moss has come in and helped to organize uh, with the RFP process our after school supports. So we have a number of vendors who were scored and this board has supported to provide after school supports. Uh, the focus of that uh, program in addition to providing uh, academic supports was also an enrichment focus because what we wanted to ensure is that the out of school time experiences though located in a school would be a little bit dissimilar from the, the core work that's happening in the school. So when there are our academic focus supports, it's from a different curriculum that is supportive but uh, distinct from what's happening during the school day such that students feel uh, engaged and there's a, a level of novelty to the time and the experiences that they uh, that they have um, and part of our model is to reframe um, what this kind of broader national conversation around learning loss to think about how we gain learning opportunities so we feel that uh, these after-school and out-of-school time experiences are very much part and parcel of that creating learning opportunities that may be somewhat uh, different um, what we know from research is indicates um, that our students who have rich experiences bring a different level of attention and understanding to even standardized achievement tests. They, they know more about the world. Um, and so we're excited about opportunities to expand coding opportunities for students, uh, to have partnerships with the Mississippi Children's Museum uh, for a number of our scholars, and to provide equitable experiences across our various uh, feeder patterns such that every um, scholar that participates in after school, these were self-selected uh, opportunities, um, there's a STEM offering in every feeder pattern, there are sports offerings in every feeder pattern, so students are getting exposure, wide exposure to um, uh, uh, soccer and uh, other sports that they may not encounter. Uh, there are real opportunities uh, for foreign language access and it was exciting uh, just Two weeks ago, I was in, at SPAN uh, after school as students were encountering uh, Spanish um, instruction. And so we're thinking about ways um, to kind of broaden the curriculum and so it gives access to these expanded opportunities that we do believe add value to just the whole child mm -hmm. and will also pay dividends in terms of their engagement um, in, in other things that we're looking to measure. Yeah. Not to mention attendance. You know, to the extent that I'm excited about coming to school, even if, even if the greater excitement is around out of school time, uh, if I'm ex excited about that, then I'm more apt to come to school and power through the, the low grade headache or the slight tummy ache or whatever uh, I might present with in that morning. So all these different ways to get at not just the specific skill and teaching that, but how do we help scholars to show up consistently ready to learn, access, and then celebrate their learning over time as whole people. That sounds how, great. How are, oh, okay. sir. Okay. Selection process that for, for the various offerings. So um, there, are, there, are two, there are probably two ways to answer that. So in terms of a selection process for our vendors and providers, we had a rubric and we looked to, uh, to evaluate their capacity to provide the supports. Uh, their staffing and team and those were scored. Um, we had some that made the cut and others that did not. Um, in terms of the student selection process, it was very much a first come, first serve process. Um, and we had uh, equitable access to the seats, but those parents, um, we uh, publicized as you all saw in the superintendent's report, there were individual signups and then we've continued to push uh, those opportunities. Um, and so. Um, we're excited about the partnership with Sylvan Learning to provide ACT support uh, to our high school scholars. And, you know, um, when with uh, the support of our high school office, really pushing out that opportunity to make certain that students are taking advantage of that, um, we're, we're looking forward to the data. Um, the work of the Sylvan Learning Center, we've seen that with that deep, intensive focus support, 
uh, scholars can gain between five to eight composite score points um, with that focused work. And so um, they're also working with our teachers uh, side by side with the Sylvan Learning Educators to give them access to that curriculum. And so we're hopeful uh, to see um, scholars taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, and it's a lot for a high schooler to commit three days a week to uh, intensive ACT support, but we've been heartened by you know, parents giving that nudge and saying, hey, this is what you need to do. You need to buckle down and, and make this commitment. And we know that it will pay dividends in terms of that composite score. So it's both the selection of the vendors and then the selection um, of parents who were uh, made available the menu of options. Okay. Thank you. Board members, any other questions or, or comments at this point at least? All right. Well, I want to thank um, Ms. Blackshear. Thank you, Dr. Cormack, and all the team members um, for the, the um, data continued, actually, uh, data analysis um, and the continued work in identifying um, not just kind of how did we do back then, but how does that data uh, sit up against the, uh, the data that we're gathering this year in um, interim assessments and, and um, uh, unit or chapter or what have you, those exams, checks for understanding, all of those things. Um, and frankly, the, all the uh, data uh, that we are gathering as we observe in classrooms of our teachers and our school leaders and instructional coaches, all those folks who are really, really taking to heart this, um, this effort around acceleration, which is forcing us to just to be much more uh, pristine and surgical about instruction and not just kind of, you know, the, you know, we're teaching in that area, but, but being much more surgical and precise. So just huge kudos to the team for the efforts to turn those numbers around and, while I'm flying low here, uh, get us to and above the uh, targets that we've set in our strategic plan. And, and just for all those listening, we have not abandoned those targets. We understand that you know we've we've had a bump in the road, and we've got some um, some um, area to and some space to make up. But we've not abandoned those targets, and and so I'm excited to continue to show um, evidence that we're we're moving on, uh, uh, closing gaps and and getting back up to where we were and far beyond. All right. All right. Thanks again, team. Uh, board members, on as you know, on September 21st, uh, you approved policy GAAJ, um, the required vaccines and, and testing for uh, JPS employees. And with the help of the Safer Management app, our team launched the COVID-19 vaccine <coughs> verification process. Um, last week, and to date, more than 2,200 of our uh, roughly 3,600 staff members um, have completed the verification process. And the deadline to provide proof of vaccination was this past Friday, October 1, although we're still seeing uh, some team members uh, submitting that information and we're, we're pleased with that. Uh, team members who, have not, um, who are not vaccinated must submit uh, to weekly testing as is uh, prescribed in the, in the policy. And beginning Wednesday, October the 6th, which is tomorrow, uh, we partnered with, um, oh, I'm sorry, they must begin that testing, which begins tomorrow, um, October the 6th. We partnered with Maverick Health uh, to offer drive-through testing free of charge to employees, but during non-working hours. And um, the weekly testing schedule is as follows on Wednesdays. It's from 2 to 6 p.m. Jeez. Thursdays um, from 12 to 6 p.m. and Fridays from 12 to 6 p.m. Um, we have four testing sites uh, in, in North and South Jackson and one in central, that's centrally located in Jackson. The sites are Transportation North, Watkins Elementary, Transportation South, uh, Woodville Heights Elementary School, and Rowan Middle School. Uh, and again, those are for drive-through testing um, uh, um, processes. All JPS employees um, uh, must complete the verification uh, process whether they're vaccinated or not. 
And, and that's just in case we need to, uh, for those who are vaccinated, we need them to uh, be tested if they have a close contact or, um, or feel some symptomology, um, they, can, they can access the, the resource that we have. Those who have not completed the verification process um, and who might be listening to us this evening should respond to the email that they receive from the Safer Management app. Um, uh, and, uh, and if they didn't receive that email, they're uh, expected to and asked to speak with and work with their uh, supervisor to provide proof of their, of their vaccination um, and to sign a consent form so that we can move forward with that. Um, we do expect that there will be lines. We do expect that, you know, the first couple of days could be a little bumpy, but we're uh, encouraged by the response that we've had from our staff. Um, we have over 50% of our team members um, who've uh, indicated and shown uh, uh, verification of, of vaccination, which is outpacing uh, the county, I believe. And so we're, we're excited by that um, and looking forward to uh, all those who are able and willing to getting vaccinated and all others just working with us to uh, go ahead and, and submit to testing. Um, board members, I believe, uh, I know that some of you are aware and so we just wanna speak uh, publicly at this point just quickly about an incident that occurred at one of our high schools this past week. Uh, we are aware of a video um, that uh, showed a, a JPS officer and, um, and one of our high school scholars in a bit of a tussle. Um, while troubling, while the video is troubling, um, our team has been interviewing all of the parties involved and been studying the video very closely, uh, reviewing our policies and practices and, and training uh, for our, our, um, our adults and specifically for our officers, just to ensure that um, what, what we are seeing there in the video, that, um, it's, um, that, that our officer is acting appropriately, even in the face of uh, inappropriate uh, behavior by our scholars. Based on the review of, um, of all of that, that data in those interviews and, and review of the video, we will uh, take any necessary actions as a, um, as a result of what we find, uh, and we're continuing in that process. I am acutely aware of the balancing act that our team members have to, have to do and, and make uh, in striking the, the balance between scholar safety and maintaining uh, order in our schools. Uh, and I would imagine that all of you sitting here and all of our parents and scholars uh, throughout our district uh, expect to be safe, expect to, um, that we ensure that there is a level of safety in our schools. Um, and at the same time, we know that we live in a time where we've got to be uh, open and honest about um, how we maintain safety and how we live into our commitment for joyful learning environments and, and, and all of our core values. So um, I did want to just name that board members that we're aware of the video that's out there. We're looking into it very closely. We're not um, ignoring it. Um, and using it as an instructive uh, experience for all of us just around expectations for scholars um, and expectations for our team members uh, and again, maintaining our joyful learning environment. Any questions about that? All right. Um, board members, it's that time again of the year each year in October, our school district um, or school districts across the country celebrate school leaders, school principals for National Principals Month. With daily challenges and opportunities um, that exist, our 52 JPS principals rise to the occasion and lead their school communities with strength, courage, and wisdom. As I think back on my experiences as a school principal, um, I think back on it with pride. It's a huge job. Um, and all too often, it's, uh, it can be a thankless job. Uh, but we want our school leaders to know that we appreciate them, that we love them, we support them, um, that we're here for them, and that we see the work that they're doing across our district. 
So in celebration of National Principals Month, um, I ask that you please join me for a round of applause for all of our JPS principals. Just again, want to say thank you to all of our amazing principals, um, amazing and dedicated leaders um, for their leadership, especially during these unprecedented times. Thank you again, principals. Um, and now, board members, Jackson Public Schools is celebrating, along with others throughout the country, National Hispanic Heritage Month, which is actually September 15th through October 15th with special activities that we have planned for, for each week. We're inviting all scholars and their families to join us in honoring the important contributions of generations of Hispanic Americans who have positively influenced and enriched our nation and the society at large. There are many Hispanic Americans who've made contributions that have enriched our nation. For example, in 1965, Ms. Dolores Huerta, a labor leader and civil rights activist helped to organize the Delano Grape Strike. This strike was to fight against the exploitation of farm workers. Her work as the lead negotiator helped farm workers receive their basic rights to fair pay as American workers. Mrs. Huerta uh, has received numerous awards for her community service and advocacy for workers, immigrants, and women's rights. She was the first Latina inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993. And now, board members, I'm very pleased to have one of our own JPS team members, Mr. Julio Del Castillo, to join us and share his reflections on Hispanic heritage and culture. Mr. Del Castillo. Good evening, good board members. Good evening. good evening. Thank you, Dr. Green. Good evening, Mr. President. Uh, again, my name is Julio Del Castillo. I moved to the city of Jackson back in 1989. I came from Peru, my homeland, and I would like to share um, a little bit about why we celebrate the Hispanic ce uh, celebration on the Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, which began in 1968. It was a one-week celebration. Basically, but then later in 1980, we extended to one month. Uh, and this month, we recognize, uh, like Dr. Green mentioned, um, a lot of, of the professionals and the contributions of the Latino and, and the nation, um, not only in education, but business-wise. Uh, we see a lot of small business also uh, in education and labor, especially. Um, now, we, we notice that there are a lot of percentage moving to the state of Mississippi from the coast um, due to the huracan and opportunities. They're moving here for housing also, and they're moving to the state also for rebuilding the coast and so on. And a uh, percentage of that population is moving to central Jackson, and they're looking for the capital city of Jackson. Mm. And I was able to help uh, with my coordinators, my colleagues from the EL department, uh, Dr. Fuller, accommodate uh, several families who move due to the huracan, uh, and they have language barrier. So back to the celebration, um, again, um, it's my honor to be here with you, my colleagues, my family of JPS, um, and um, we have a great team uh, in the record department. That's half of the time I spend it. But um, just to something for you to remember today, um, although we all Hispanics uh, are over 50 million in the nation of Hispanic population. Um, a little over 61% are from Mexico families. Uh, the rest, the 39%, we are Latinos from South America or Central America. So in my experience, and that's something for you to remember, is uh, when I came here, I was uh, about 29 years old, and I came from the airport from Miami, and I moved here, and of course, the land was flat, and I was looking all my experience, what I saw on TV growing up, 
But uh, in one of the few things I remember arriving um, and walking in the street to a restaurant, they asked me, how are the burritos and tacos are in Peru? <laughs> and I said, oh my goodness, what is? And honestly, that was the first time and my, uh, I ate the food. And later on, uh, I was uh, listening to say, oh, people are Mexicans or something. And I thought to myself, look, I'm going to teach uh, and you know, talk about why the importance to be called Latinos, Hispanics. Uh, not all of it come from Mexico. <laughs> we are from different backgrounds. And, and I want to share something in the last minute, it's something I grew up with, if you may. Um, it's an outfit that um, I wear in growing up. This is called, uh, this is called the poncho. And growing up from Cusco, Peru, this is what we wear over there. It's a, it's a typical poncho uh, coming with a hat. And this is one of the instruments we play down in Peru. Uh, if you may, I'm going to wear it and play for you a little bit. <laughs> it's called a uh, sampoña. It's a flute. Instruments. Uh, it's bamboo growing in the Titicaca Lake. is the highest lake in the Altiplano of, um, of Peru and Bolivia. And this is actually my original flag. Um, but I would like to share that it's more than uh, being called Mexican. We are from 17 countries. Actually, Brazil is one of the largest ones. And Calas Latinos or Hispanics is what we like to be called. If you May and um, so I just want to share my experience and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Mr. Del Castillo, thank you so much for for joining us this evening and for sharing just a just a, a little bit. Uh, about your country. Um, I haven't yet made it to Peru, but it is absolutely on my list of places to visit. Uh, board members, as we uh, prepare to reopen our board meetings and bring our team members and our scholars um, to board meetings just to share a bit about their experiences with us here and just their experiences in life, just think it's so important um, as a, a part of who we are as an educational institution to help our children to see themselves as a part of the world, not just their neighborhood, not just our city, not just our state or even this country, but as a part of the world. And so excited to have wonderful people like our brother uh, Del Castillo uh, here as a part of JPS and all of the others who are doing that very work, helping our scholars to see themselves in part of the, the larger um, spectrum across the world. So thank you. Um, sincere thanks. Dr. Uh, Sivak, with that, that concludes my comments this evening. Um, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. No, thank you, Dr. Green. Um, and uh, Mr. Dick, I see you. Thank you for sharing your, your, your heritage with us and, and your story as well. Um, and it's just a reminder that we all have unique stories and um, look forward to bringing students back in as well to share theirs. Um, so um, with that, we will move on. Actually, Dr. Green, I am going to ask one question. Um, I, I didn't know if it was, you were going to cover it later in your report. I, I was going to ask it during the, um, the, the uh, update from the, the scores, from the testing. Um, uh, but, but I'm going to I'm not going to ask the whole question. I basically was just going to ask for an update on busing. Um, I know that we, we've encountered some uh, challenges um, uh, getting students home uh, and just wanted to uh, just, again, acknowledge that and also hear kind of what steps were taken to address um, challenges that, that families may have encountered our first uh, quarter of school here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sivak, for that question. Um, so there are two kind of, well, probably more than that, but two um, uh, issues that I'll kind of uh, speak to. One is the ongoing challenge that uh, we are certainly experiencing here and that others are experiencing across the country, really, around labor and the challenges of just not having the numbers of uh, bus drivers, um, and other team members, frankly, um, to, to ensure the level of, of um, consistency 
um, that we would want to see. And so our bus drivers and our transportation team is working feverishly to fill holes and where we have, so we're already down um, some number of drivers, but where we have uh, issues where we have to quarantine or where folks are, are out for any reason, trying to find subs and, and just all of that, it's, it's, uh, it's a real challenge for us. And so um, definitely acknowledging that that um, is a challenge, but not just for us in, in the district and in our office and, and on the transportation team, but a, a challenge that is shared and I know is a cause of frustration for many of our, our families. And so acknowledging that and um, great empathy for what families are, are dealing with and trying to manage through that. Um, as we continue uh, looking for uh, thoughtful ways to build up the team and, and ensure that we've got the, the staffing to, um, to uh, carry forward all of the bus routes as, as need be, um, and that's not to mention any, if we ever have a bus breakdown or any of that sort of thing, but that just for staffing, um, we're, we are thinking creatively about ways to identify additional um, uh, part-time or substitute drivers to, to support us with that. The other big issue, though, is um, around communications. And we've certainly heard from some number of parents who were, um, you know, concerned about uh, their child being picked up late or dropped off late, um, but more concerned, even more concerned, and I, I know rightfully so, that they were not informed. And so they're, you know, wondering what's going on and they haven't heard from us and, and that. And so um, as it happens, uh, we actually, a, a number of the executive team members of us and, and the head of our uh, transportation team were meeting today um, looking at some short-term, very, very short-term uh, options and ways to increase communications to families, but also uh, some uh, smarter use of technology to address that. Uh, we have an app that we utilize. We've got a, um, a district app that we utilize, and so we're um, working through some ways to uh, increase the functionality there so that we can push out notices to families. I mean, that was p part of the, the thinking even early on. It's just it's more acute and, and more urgent a need, and so we'll be working with uh, some of our partners to, to assist us in um, positioning ourselves to push out notices to families. Um, of course, that means that families will have to download the app, but, but I believe we can um, increase the usage there. Um, but also ensuring that there's a smart um, and consistent coupling between our um, transportation department and our school leaders and school teams, um, at least in the short run, so that um, as we see um, some kind of a, a delay happening or that we believe will happen, someone has to call, call out or what have you, um, that we can get those messages out to school communities um, more quickly so that parents can plan um, and at least be aware of, of those delays happening. Um, I say those things very, very simply and um, just please trust me when I say uh, they should be simple. They simply are not. Um, we've got data quality issues with telephone numbers. We've got you know all sorts of things that that just continue to be challenges <laughs> for doing what what should be very simple things, um, uh, even in some of the worst times for staffing and and that. Um, but again, uh, I appreciate the question. We certainly want to be as transparent as possible about the challenges that we're. Uh, experiencing, um, knowing that parents and families are experiencing the same on the other end, but also about some of the ways that we're seeking to address them um, in the short term and, and in the longer term. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that was really the, you, you, you lifted up the point of me asking the question was just about just, just you know, bringing it forward here, acknowledging it, naming it. And you know we'll continue to work on it together. Yes, sir. Um, all right. Well, now, um, Attorney Turner, do we, we do not have any public co uh, comments? Anyone signed up? No. Um, and so, uh, all 
given that there are none, uh, just remind uh, the community that anyone who would like to make public comment should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. Uh, this, before the start of the meeting. Um, next, uh, we will move on to our information only items and our first item is our bond update. Um, and so I believe Ms. Robinson and Ms. Franklin will be joining us to give us our monthly update. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Seaback, board members, Dr. Green. At the first uh, board meeting of each month, we have the pleasure of presenting the bond update. Tonight, the pres presentation overview will include construction updates, the bond financial report update, the board uh, action dates on uh, the remaining uh, projects, and also we're going to conclude with a bond completion status on schools and projects. Ms. Franklin will start us off with the construction updates. Good evening, board members. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Tonight we'll start at looking at um, some of our phase two schools. Um, we'll look at start at Boyd Elementary School. We've seen this set of restrooms before that are under renovation. Uh, before we saw where the walls had been closed in and where the plumbing was updated. Now we see some uh, more progress. The plumbing fixtures have gone in. The uh, partitions are going in. Um, and the epoxy flooring has been completed. Next, we'll be doing updating the lighting and the painting in those restrooms. At Lake Elementary, we also have restroom renovations in progress. Here we see where the walls have been closed in with the concrete backer board, the plumbing inside the walls, and the drain lines have been updated. Next, at Smith Elementary School, we have restroom renovations in progress there. This is one set that have been completed. All of the fixtures have been uh, updated, the lighting, the partitions, flooring, as well as tile work. Next, the contractor is starting on an uh, additional set of restrooms at Smith. Next, at Rains, uh, we're looking at demolition in a set of girls' and boys' <coughs> toilets there. Um, all of the walls have been torn out so that the plumbing inside the chase walls can be updated. Um, this is just one set of three sets of restrooms that will be renovated at Rains. Next at Walton Elementary School, we have one set of restrooms being renovated there. On the left, we see the previous condition of those restrooms. On the right, we see the progress where the plumbing fixtures have been installed, the tile has been installed, and uh, next we're just waiting on the painting um, and some light fixtures and accessories and the partitions. Next, at some of our high schools at Jim Hill, uh, our library renovation is still in progress there. We see the flooring is in progress. Um, the ceiling grid has been installed, as well as um, the circulation desk. Uh, we're still waiting on the lighting, the acoustical ceilings, and some millwork that will go throughout uh, the library and the offices there. At Forest Hill High School, we have our performing arts project in progress. And it includes renovations in the auditorium, the band hall, and two art classrooms. This is in the auditorium. All of the seating has been removed and flooring. And we see um, there's plaster repair on some of the walls there. Um, so we're still kind of in the demolition phase there. Next at Provine High School, um, all of the projects at Provine have been completed with the exception of the library. Here we see the demolition here. All the lighting is, uh, old lighting has been taken out, the flooring, and the contractors has started repairing some of the plaster walls there. Uh, next we'll look at some of our athletic fields. At South Jackson, we looked at this field uh, at our last month's update. Here on the left, uh, that's a photo in the officials lounge area where we have new casework being installed. On the far right, we see on the grandstand, we have a new bleacher system and a new handrail system going in. In the middle, we see the uh, new ticket booth that was built. Um, next at Hughes Field, this will be a complete renovation of that field also. Um, 
and it includes uh, remodeling the home cons home side visitor home side and visitors locker room as well as uh, concession stands you see all the walls there marked in blue are going to be demoed um, all those old plumbing fixtures are coming out and each of those buildings will get a new configuration as well as new roofs um, next we'll take a look at a rendering for Newell Field um, and this project is still under review with archives and history but we're going to look at some of the we're seeing here some of the elements that they're requiring us to keep in place the two concrete end walls as well as the back concrete uh, pilasters are required to stay in place and we'll infill that system with a new aluminum bleacher system and below we'll have new restrooms and concession stands and up top we'll have um, some added press boxes and the old press box will stay will remain in place um, next Ms. Robinson will give us an update on our financials Thank you, Ms. Franklin. I know we're excited to see those pictures of Hughes Field and Newell Field on our athletic improvements. So, so far, um, as of October 1, we have expended or, or encumbered 87% of our bond funds. That's an increase of 84% from our last bond update. The orange shows the amount expended. We are almost 50% expended now with $34.8 million expended. The green, I mean, the gray shows the amount encumbered, and we are at 37.9 percent encumbered. That's over 26 million, and then the amount uh, to be encumbered is uh, about 8.5 million. Next slide. Uh, the next three slides give a breakdown, school by school, of the budget expenditures to date, encumbered, and the budget balance. So I won't read those three slides to you, but uh, we'll have that information if you want to look at each school uh, by school. So for the projected board action timeline for the remaining projects in October, uh, the next meeting, we will come to you with recommendations on Wells, APAC, and McLeod. For the Wells, APAC project, uh, the bids that were received uh, did not meet um, the bid requirements, so we will have to rebid the Wells, APAC project. But we, do, we will come with a recommendation at the um, next board meeting for, to award McLeod. Um, but we will immediately rebid uh, the Wells, um, APAC project. In November, we uh, plan to come with recommendations on the Newell Field renovations, as well as uh, drainage and, tr and utility improvements at Isabel, McWillie, Cardozo, and Kirksey. And our final major project, uh, the baseball softball fields, we plan to come with a recommendation in December 2021 for that. Um, we lost one little element on this slide, so we wanted to show you our completed schools. Uh, the completed schools so far with all the bond projects, we have five, um, Lee, Obama, and the part that's missing, there was a timber line there, so we had technical difficulties. Uh, the one thing that is shown that uh, we do want to clarify is the playground canopy. You won't see a green check there on some of the um, projects, but on a, a forthcoming slide, I'll explain about the playground canopies. So the next slide shows Van Winkle and um, CDC. So we've completed all the projects there um, at both schools, with the exception of the playground canopy at Van Winkle. Um, so today, uh, with the bond um, projects, there was initially a bond fact sheet that listed um, school projects specific to every school. Uh, for those projects that have been assigned to design firms, we had a 312 projects. Currently, there are 17 um, still under design. Uh, total under construction is 120. Total completed is 107, and total remaining are 68. Of those 68, 22 are playground canopies. And what we um, found with ESSER 3 that we were able to expand on those can uh, playground canopies to um, actually do some outdoor learning environments. So we've allocated money in our ESSER 3 um, application to do outdoor learning environments so we can do more things than just install a canopy. And of those uh, 46 of the 68, uh, 68 remaining projects, we're going to um, prioritize. I had a typo. We corrected that, but it's there. Prioritize uh, the ESSER 2 and 3 projects to do additional restroom renovations, HVAC upgrades, structural repairs, and window replacements. So all of those projects couldn't fit in the available bond funds, but we're uh, maximizing our ESSER 
two and three funds to be able to do those projects. So do you have any questions? Before, board members, before um, uh, yeah, we open up for questions, there are two things that um, I think the, as we discussed, I want to make sure that the expand, um, I'm sorry, the expended dollar amounts by school in those projects, yes. um, that we have that on our website. Okay. Because um, uh, I believe there was some interest in, in sharing that out. And then um, we had gotten requests or questions about Wells APAC, and so just want to clarify the board and, and others listening that um, because of the, we need to rebid, correct, we need to rebid. So the, the concern about interrupting performance rehearsal, well, rehearsal and performance there for their season um, is kind of moot at this point until we get rebid and, and look again at schedule. So we don't expect to interrupt that, correct? That's correct. Okay. I believe there was something else, but we'll see if there are questions. I don't have any questions. I just want to commend the team for the excellent job that you guys done and the progress that has been made and the urgency that has been shown in getting these projects done. And I'm just grateful for that and grateful for the team and the good work. It's exciting to get these updates. Mm -hmm. Here, here. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Dr. Luckett. Thank you so much for your work and to be able to do it all in the midst of a global pandemic. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I did have a question on uh, Hughesfield. Are we um, going to put turf down at Hughesfield? Is that also part of the scope? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just. The South Field, I was down there for homecoming, and it's a great place to enjoy a game, and it's exciting to hear, and that's part of it. The field looks great, and so that's exciting to hear in terms of just adding additional spaces across the district. Um, and then um, on, it was great to see the new field renderings as well. Is that that field already is turf? Are we going to redo the turf field? Is it part of it to redo the turf there yes, as well? Yes, we're redoing the existing turf. Okay. And... I remember, I know we're getting close on budget. Were, were we going to look at a track there as well? Um, there's a four-lane track that's there that we're, we are going to put yeah. back and um, redo that's but there. It a, a practice track. It won't be an eight-lane track because there's not enough space here. That makes sense. But there will be um, a track included in that new addition. Okay. That's great. Um, so I'll just repeat. So there will be a four-lane practice track. There's not enough space for eight lanes, which, which actually and make, be, makes sense. It'll be rubberized in here. Oh, okay. That's that's great. All right. Those were my questions. Oh, and then we also talked about the fields. We're looking at a strategy to, to increase the number of fields, baseball fields across the district. Is it, was that part of what we is currently being considered? Well, we're actually considering um, – the baseball and softball going at the new um, athletic complex, which which is Hardy and Hughes Field, in that area. That's oh. where we're looking at putting it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And continuing, uh, I'll say it's it's still early, but continuing conversations, some really promising conversations, um, for identifying additional spaces uh, for our scholars to practice and. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and play in baseball and softball. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, team. Really appreciate all your work. Y'all can see they're, they're hustling to get them complete. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Indeed. <laughs> um, I also, uh, Dr. Green, appreciate the um, reference to sharing the information on the website. I, I, as we get close to closing out, um, really would like to um, encourage, challenge, ask you and the team to think about a way that we can just post all the progress and, and make it clear for any member of the community, you know, how much was spent, you know, who did the work, what it looked like before, what it looked like after, so that, you know, when anyone asks the question, where did all that money go, we can just say, just go to the website, and it's so clear. Mm -hmm. And so then when the next board is here and has to marshal the community to vote for a bond, that question, it won't even be a question of where the money went because it's going to already be out there for all to see. And so, you know, that's, again, we've got to get to the end of it all. And we got some time on that, but just wanted to put that out there as well. 
Absolutely, we received that, and um, I'll say uh, we we've, we've got to figure out how to um, artfully and and clearly articulate not only that we fulfilled the bond, but that we were able to leverage additional dollars to do to go beyond what what the bond would would afford. Um, because as you've seen, we we've, we've had at least I don't know at this point at least ten, probably more than that. Uh, projects that we've had to go back out for rebidding mm -hmm. because they've come in above or uh, over budget. And so as we, yeah, there, there, there's plenty more than the bond called for that we're going to be able to do, that we have done and will do. Um, and so getting all of that captured. Bond plus. Okay. <laughs> Good branding. <laughs> All right. Um, well, next, um, we, we will continue to move on with our information only items, and we have a, a review of the agreement between Seidlitz Education and the Jackson Public School District. Um, Tiffany Love Fuller, the manager of um, EL and Special Populations, will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the administration would like to recommend the approval of seven steps to language a language rich in, uh, interactive classroom for professional development and it's offered by the Silence Education Group. The uh, professional development will provide an innovative training which will help our English uh, learners, uh, teachers, as well as our content area teachers um, transform their classrooms into vibr vibrant spaces where students can use academic language to talk, to read, to write, and think about each lesson's content. Uh, these seven steps uh, training outlines a dynamic process for structuring, um, planning, and facilitating a language-rich classroom. Um, in addition, participants uh, that our ESL teachers will gain a knowledge of helpful ways to integrate both content and language standards within the planning um, instruction. They will also receive specific strategies for differentiating instruction so that all learners in the classroom can build their ability to d discuss and communicate academic concepts effectively. Thank you, Ms. Love Fuller. Um, board members, are there any questions or comments? Um, I had uh, just a couple. Um, the first is uh, just wanted to know if you had reached out to any other districts who had used this service in the past, and, and if so, what did we learn? I did. I reached out to Alvin Independent School District. Um, they have actually used uh, the Silas Group for over 15 years. Um, they have seen great success um, with their English learners and utilizing their, um, their um, professional development. Um, when I reached out to them, I also found out they recently had done a, um, had followed a cohort. Um, this cohort uh, started in junior high, I believe, and, and they started them in junior high, I believe, and moved them to, to high school. Um, their findings were a significant in increase in their graduation um, uh, with this particular cohort. cohort. Um, the also, one thing that they were able to say is that they saw growth in their um, elementary uh, versus their um, secondary, but it was a uh, more significant increase when, when utilized with uh, teachers and students in the uh, secondary level. Hmm. Um, on, that's really, really helpful. Um, actually, and I appreciate that you went to Houston um, to, to look at a get a reference um can you report that last point i'm I, I didn't connect the dots on it you were making a point about the the um, outcomes student outcomes of the elementary relative to the secondary mm -hmm. students who participated in the program yes well what they found was that there was growth in uh both areas but there was a significant growth when you looked at secondary versus elementary um, and part of that um, was the result of that the language skills are more developed once you're in your in secondary. They're not usually at a beginning stage with our um, English learners. So since that foundation is there and you're 
teaching those strategies to those students, they felt like that growth was um, more significant in the secondary. Okay, and, and our plan is to use it in which grades? In the secondary. In the secondary, As okay. well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, board members, um, we have the approval of the purchasing agent for Jackson Public Schools. Um, Ms. Margaret Purnell, our interim chief financial officer, will present the information. Dr. Seelag, the board members, Dr. Green, my colleagues, the Jackson Public School team. Uh, this afternoon, I am asking on behalf of the administration and the office of the superintendent that uh, we, we are requesting the approval to authorize the chief financial officer as the uh, purchasing agent for Jackson Public Schools. And as you all know, this is uh, an oversight from the Office of uh, State Auditor's Office and a request of that from one of those findings. Thank you. Board members, are there any questions about this item? If there are not, I think we'll just run through these and take a motion at the end for all of them, unless there's any objection. Okay. okay. All right. The next one is uh, the administration is requesting approval of the final amended budgets for our combining and combined budgets for as of June 30th of 2021. And you also know this is a uh, compliance from the state auditor's office as well, that the amended budget budgets must be submitted to the board and approved and signed by them uh, as of uh, June 30th. Thank also, you. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Jump. And then I just want to just uh, we made a, a few things about it, even though it's in, um, in the packet from it. Uh, we're talking about a few of the major uh, budgets from that. District maintenance, uh, 1120, did end up with $193,220,300 at the end. Uh, from that, we had revenue of $3.5 million, and those came from delinquent tax sales. As you all know, at the end of August, from the uh, tax collector's office, we do receive tax, uh, tax sale funds, and this year it did come in, as a matter of fact, for about 4.5, but we did accrue for 3.5 of those dollars as of June 30th of 2021. We did have a loss in revenue in a few of our um, revenue accounts, which was in tuition, interest income, and use of facilities, which you all know that we weren't having a whole lot of activities going on there, so, and the interest rates, of course, are down. On the expenses side, we did have about $513,000 from prior um, new expenditures that were not actually uh, designated or classified for federal funds that had to actually come to the district fund for a few uh, things that were not allocated on the federal side. We also had to do an additional transfer in of roughly over $800,000 for um, our exceptional ad fund for this year when we do our transfer in. At the end of the year, we did have more expenditures than uh, we had allocated revenue for those. We did have to do an additional uh, funds on that. Then we had a few di different things on benefits, which we all know that uh, as of January, normally our Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, funds normally go up, so and it is going to go up this year as well. So there are some, some di uh, additional benefits that has to come through. And also, we always have uh, a small amount of overtime uh, in our different areas, so that's also contributing to a part of the budget process on that end. The other funds you'll probably notice on the amended budget are just uh, a lot of our major funds as well, but they're already in the uh, executive summary that you can review when you um, need to, but it's nothing major, just the regular ones uh, from that except with the uh, bond funds, which you would always have to classify as a major fund as well. Any questions? Board members, any questions on this report? I think the main question I have is answered in, in the questions Bill asked here. So, so with the amendments made to revenue and with the amendments made to the expenditures, it looked like we still ended the year with an increase 
small, but Very still small. it wasn't a decrease in our district maintenance fund balance and our general fund balance. Is that correct? That is correct, and that is pre-audit. So we're going to continue to strive that the auditors will do this. We'll find the same thing uh, at the end when they finalize our audit. Great. So, so we don't, at least at this stage of the game, anticipate any additional amendments to the 2021 budget? No. All right. That's good news. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, next, board members. We have Ms. Lyons, um, who uh, has one of our favorite items to approve, which is the approval of the Mississippi Employer Assisted Housing Teacher Program. Mm -hmm. Great evening, Dr. Green, Board President Sivak, members of the board. The loan agreement before you is between the Mississippi Department of Education in conjunction with Fannie Mae and the teacher listed in board material. A maximum loan amount of $6,000 is available to an eligible teacher to assist in paying the closing costs of the home. And the teacher must agree to render three years of service to the district. Based on the information, based on this information, the Office of Human Resources is recommending approval of the Mississippi Employer Assisted Housing Teacher, teacher Program Loan Agreement for a teacher at Whitten Middle, Middle School. Great. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Board members, are there any questions? Okay. Um, next, uh, we'll invite Dr. Merritt to join us for the approval of the memorandum of agreement between Grand Canyon University and the Jackson Public School District. Great evening to Dr. Seaback and Board of Trustees, Dr. Green. The administration is recommending to the board that Grand Canyon University College of Education be contracted to provide student teaching internship in the Jackson Public School District during the 2021 uh, through 2024 fall and spring semesters. This partnership with Grand Canyon University is new uh, to the district and we are happy to add Grand Canyon University to our portfolio of uh, colleges and universities that provide student teachers to Jackson Public School District. Are there any questions? Board members, any questions? Uh, Dr. Warren, I have one. So, you know, we, we, we see our, our local schools and are excited about the agreements, you know, throughout the state. And then we see one from Grand Canyon University, which just struck me. It's a, I think it's a university in Phoenix. How, how did we end up with this engagement? So, um, based on my understanding, we have an employee that is enrolled in, um, graduate, in the graduate or teacher certification program at Grand Canyon. So as such, in order to provide um, her the opportunity to do this intern experience, um, they needed to um, formalize a partnership with us. Uh, we do think in the future there will be more students uh, as they uh, seek out online opportunities that will um, uh, join in these ranks Great. from this university. So we have a brand ambassador out there is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Next, um, we have the approval to award RFP 2021-16 for the district benchmark informative assessment services. And Dr. Smith, our executive director of teaching and learning, will share this information. Great evening. To uh, President Seabag, board members, Dr. Green, our JPS community. It brings me um, a great privilege with this particular um, um, uh, ask. The administration is presenting the information um, action approval for this award for RFP 2116 district benchmark formative assessment services for K through second grade. Uh, the purpose of this proposal, it will allow the district to um, continue to engage our young scholars and teachers in um, more of our data analysis. The data gathered from the K-2 assessments will enable schools to track students' performance on priority standards prior to entering third grade. Teachers will have the usage of test banks to create more rigorous, high-quality standard-aligned assessments to determine mastery of the standards. And, they will, and teachers will also be able to use the data to make necessary adjustments to their instruction. 
The platform will enable K-2 teachers to create assessments as well as allow the district to administer standardized assessments so that we can continue to analyze the performance of our K-2 scholars district-wide just like we do third through eighth in high school. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Smith. Board members, are there any questions? All right, hearing none, um, we will invite Ms. Erin Mason up to join us to share information on the approval uh, of a data sharing agreement between Bright Bites and the Jackson Public School District. Good evening. Uh, this evening, the administration is requesting approval of an agreement between the Jackson Public School District and the Bright Bites um, company. This is a data sharing agreement that will allow us to share data both with Bright Bites and with the Mississippi Department of Education. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Board members, are there any questions? Ms. Mason, I did have one. It's my understanding from the prep materials that, that we, this is a requirement. Is, is It's something that, that MDE, is, the Mississippi Department of Education, is requiring of all uh, districts that are engaged in this work. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's an arrangement that is required. They um, wrote it into their grant, and we received the EDL, the Education Digital Literacy Act funds, back in the fall of 2020. Um, we agreed to participate in this program in, in order to receive those funds. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, board members, um, with that, we have gone through our information action uh, item agenda. Is there a motion to approve these items, items A through F? Mr. President, I move that we approve information action items A through F. A second. Um, Dr. Luckett has moved. Ms. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda items for finance. Um, all consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had the opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Uh, Ms. Purnell, I did have um, one question. I'll invite you up for this. And it's, it's in reference to the approval of the extended school year for fiscal 2021, 2021, I believe. Um, and uh, I believe that these funds are, th this is, a, is it my understand correct that the, the action here is um, basically we've expended the funds it, it, to get reimbursed by the Mississippi Department of Education. We need to request the, the funds, is that correct? That is correct. We have to expend the funds first. And then when we expend them, then they will uh, request, they will uh, send us those funds. And Dr. Bingham has already made that request. Um, Dr. Green has already signed off on that. So we've sent that off already. So we were doing just amending the budget, pretty much sending it that back. But in verses for 21, 22, it's really started in June of 21. And it goes through to June of 21, since it is um, extended for the uh, exception ed students. And so uh, since that, what that program actually does. Okay, and it, and it, it also covers July as well, is it that does. correct? It so, does, So July. it includes Positive. this fiscal year as well, okay. It does, it overlaps. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, board members, thank you for um, allowing me to ask those questions. Um, the, uh, with that, um, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda items for finance. So moved. Second. Uh, Ms. Johnson has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Next, we have our consent agenda item general. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Board members, I did want to make one um, note. Uh, we did move the um, approval of the agreement for our after school programs down to the consent agenda items. If in the board prep materials, it was listed in um, information action. Uh, it was, uh, the, the request is simply a clerical error, um, and that was reflected in the executive summary. Um, all parties it's, uh, have um, 
been notified and there's no issue with it. That's why it's there. I just wanted to signal it to the board that it was moved. Um, so with that, uh, are there any, um, can I get a motion? I so move. Oh. Dr. Harrison, did you have a question? Yes, I did. And um, I didn't quite understand what you said about moving uh, item C, 10C, the approval of the amendment to the Sure. Actually, let's invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Cormack's going to come up and um, explain the the um, the change that was made. And I was just signaling to the board where it was moved in the agenda from the prep materials. But but Dr. Cormack's going to explain the the update. Sure. Dr. Okay. Harrison. Do, uh, do we have any written? Excuse me if I'm out of order, uh, President. Do we have any written material on the changes other than what's on the agenda? The new agenda? No, it's, it, they were all, all the changes were in the prep materials. I, I was just signaling that it moved on the agenda from, from the prep materials, but everything that we've been asked to do, there's been no change since we received the information on Thursday. Will we be able to ask questions? Please, and actually, let's have Dr. Cormack present the information, Dr. Harrison, and then, then let's ask questions after that. <clears throat> Okay, that's okay. Thank you so much. Sure. sure. So uh, the administration is requesting uh, the approval of an amendment to the amiable produ uh, productions agreement. Uh, the agreement uh, that the board approved and uh, the amount for amiable uh, productions uh, was $200,000. Um, and so we do have a contract that has been board approved for that amount. However, um, what we're attempting to do is to make certain that the clerical error um, it, is corrected. So there was um, in, the, in another component of materials, 250,000 indicated. And so what we have done both in the executive summary is to clarify that 200,000 was the agreed upon amount. The vendor had not made plans or preparations for the additional 50,000 and the board approved a contract for $200,000. Um, in an effort to avoid a future finding, we wanted to correct this issue um, to basically assure that $200,000 meant $200,000 across all documents. And so the executive summary reflects that the um, desire to move it to consent agenda item uh, was simply a reflection of uh, a better placement on the agenda, but no substantive uh, changes, no changes at all have been made to the item itself. Hmm. Is this the time I can ask my question? Please, Dr. Harrison. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as reading through the material, I did have some uh, questions about exactly our target organization, or our target schools, and I, so we are planning to serve high schools. Our high schools, is that correct? There, I'm, 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 I may be misunderstanding the question. Okay. Well, if the paperwork that I am reading, and I hope it's not out of date, I was trying to wrap my head around exactly which schools we are serving and who will be the staff. And at some place, the language says all of our students will have access, but then other places, understood it to say high school. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what schools are being served, how many students are going to be served, who are the staff. A lot of little nitpicky questions I sure. have because I'm not sure if it's a, new, a staff coming in to run this or is staff being trained as principals and IT teachers. Okay. So I believe I better understand your question. So um, I can understand the confusion. So uh, to clarify, uh, Amiable Productions is one of the vendors that uh, was awarded an after-school project through our RFP process. So on um, the service that they were able to provide, we agreed that they met the criteria uh, that had been specified in the survey to serve children. The um, clarity around access versus all schools, um, I can specify. So the design of our after-school program, we didn't want to stand up programs at all 53 
uh, schools in the district. We, we simply didn't have the capacity to do that with the level of quality that we wanted. However, what we did commit to in uh, developing the criteria was equitable access across each feeder pattern. And so when you see uh, high schools implicated, there may be, for instance, um, one of the activities is uh, Paradise Sports. That's an activity that is available and targeted for our elementary schools, and it's as equitably accessible across feeder patterns. So they are supporting sports programming in each high school feeder pattern, but that is a program and a partnership specifically targeted to elementary scholars. Uh, the ACT prep that I mentioned uh, before, Sylvan Learning, is a uh, partnership uh, equitably accessible across high school feeder pattern, but it is primarily for our high school scholars. And so that may be the, um, the, a bit of confusion around that. It was designed to make certain that within each feeder pattern, the same kinds of offerings were equitably accessible, though that might not be at their scholar school, but would be uh, something that we could transport students to across the feeder pattern. I see. And who will craft these programs? Are they JPS staff and principals and teachers, or so staff? Yeah, so there's a bit of both. Um, we have, we, the programming is coordinated within the school sites, within the dedicated school sites, so the, um, the 26 locations across the district each have a after-school a principal, essentially, that has been designated. Usually that's an assistant principal in the building, um, and then in some instances it's another administrator who is serving as the after-school lead. Um, for academic programming, you have uh, a number of our teachers who are serving in complementary roles with external vendors, and so they're always on site to provide a, an additional level of supervision and support to the after-school external vendors that we have brought in um, and that have, were awarded the RFP contract. So it's a blending of both external vendor support and also our internal uh, teacher supports, inclusive of custodians um, from the district, um, a number of our teachers, which is inclusive of a special educator at each of the school teams, and, um, and then our JPS transportation services. So it's a blending of both internal and external staff. Great. That's helpful. That, that makes sense. I only have two more quick questions. Um, on page one, and, uh, they use the acronym YFP Leadership Team. Is that something that we should know or, or a situation of the YFP? I just did not know what that was and YFP instructors. But these are the instructors that come with the amiable production. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Great. Okay. I got you. And then um, my last question was, oh, uh, similar to Dr. Chief, I the question, do we know of any um, work that Amiable has done within other school districts and what we can learn from, from their work there? So I would be speaking out of my depth um, on, on this. I'm, I'm standing in for, for Dr. Moss at this juncture. Um, we can certainly, I can certainly review the uh, documents that we reviewed, um, that the external, our internal team uh, reviewed uh, to settle on them as a, a selected vendor but, um, and return with an answer. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. And those were great questions. And, and again, it's, 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 I just want to just lift up and appreciate the questions because it's, it's critical that when we're voting, we know what we're voting on. And, and so please, and it's, never, it's never a problem. Um, so are there any other questions? All right. Well, with that, I'll take a motion on the consent agenda items, General. So moved. Second. Ms. Johnson has moved. Ms. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Next, we have the consent agenda item for personnel. All of the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we have had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item for personnel? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Aye. <coughs> Nays, there being none, the motion is approved. Um, we do have a consideration of an executive session. Is there a motion to close the meeting to consider the need to go into executive session? So moved. Second. Ms. Johnson has moved. Ms. Hood has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Thank you, everyone. Uh, um, have a great night.